Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the Book of Acts, the first and only authentic history of the early Christian Church. And we have a really important lesson to talk about today entitled the Jerusalem Council. And those of you who are familiar with the Book of Acts will recognize that that's Acts 15 where most of our scriptures will come from for today. As usual, and this, by the way, is our lesson number eight for August, of tw August 25 of 2018. As usual, we'd like to begin with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, it is a privilege, a wonderful privilege to meet with others of like faith and conviction and study your word. We thank you so much for the insights that we have been given to understand the the trials and the challenges that the early church went through and see what we can learn from their experiences. May that be our experience today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, <clears throat> some would consider the stoning of Stephen the first major crisis in the Christian church, but that was probably um, a, a good thing. And this was probably too, but this was the first major crisis after the church sort of really got itself organized. And how did it come about? Well, you know when there's change, when there's people doing other things and new people joining the crowd, there's somebody going to compl complain about something. You can be sure of that. After the stoning of Stephen, the Christians that were scattered out, and after Pentecost as well, people were scattered out through the Middle East, and now we're going to see them coming back together and making some conclusions. Paul and Barnabas, in that experience, as we studied last week, were sent out by the church at Antioch in Syria. And they traveled first to Cyprus and then into southern Turkey, we call it today, or Asia Minor, as it was known in those days, and Pamphylia and Perga and so forth like that, and then on up inside in the interior of the country over the mountains. John Mark, of course, left them there at Perga, went back home. But uh, when they got home, after that experience, remember, it's hard for us, we just read through this, and there's like a chapter, we read through it, and we forget that that journey took them almost two years. Two years. They're going from city to city and building up churches and establishing uh, things there in, 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 that, in, those, in that area. So, of course, they converted a number of Jews to Christianity and also quite a number of Gentiles. And that was the problem. So when they came back to the Antioch church, what do you suppose happened? Could you guess? Anybody who knows a little bit about what was going on in the Christian church at that point in time will recognize it. You come back and there's, there are two groups with a little bit of tension. One group thinking that we we really need to stick close to our Jewish roots. Another group saying, well, no, we got a lot of Gentiles joining us now. We need to allow some freedom to them. Well, it became a problem. And of course, the problem centered in the minds of many, the Jewish leaning people, on the question of circumcision. And why is circumcision a big question? Well, to the Jewish converts, to, well, to the, yeah, the Jewish converts to Christianity, they somehow had the idea that in order to really be a Christian, you had to be a part of the group. You had to be a part of that particular thing that was the Jewish people. And they thought you had to sort of become a Jew before you could become a Christian. And unfortunately, what happened is some people with those kind of convictions came up from Jerusalem and realized the freedom they had in Antioch and the freedom in which they shared everything and uh, raised lots of questions. Um, to just get a feel for that, uh, we need to look at two passages. The first one is Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 21. Some, some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message to Jews only. 
Now, we don't know whether anybody had been, any Christians had been in Antioch before, maybe from having been converted uh, at the time of Pentecost, three and a half years earlier. We just don't know. But they got a, a church going in Antioch. But other believers, by, by the way, telling the message to Jews only. But other believers who are from Cyprus and Cyrene, where is Cyrene located? Libya. In Africa, Libya. Libya. Yeah. Today it would be called Libya. Imagine Christian missionaries going from Libya to Syria in our day. Went, they went to Antioch, proclaimed the message to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And you know what's surprising to me? We don't even know the names of those people who intentionally, first, without strong, you know, Peter went and talked to Cornelius with a, with a lot of shoving from the Lord, and uh, others did, I mean, you know, Philip did it. He was transported by God. <laughs> you get to talk to that guy over there. But here are some people who just did it voluntarily. And you remember the story in Galatians 2 about what happened when some people came from, Antioch, came from Jerusalem up to Antioch, and Peter, you know, better not stop, better not be eating with these Gentiles or there'll be a problem. And pretty soon he had others, even Barnabas, after his experience with Paul, was drawing back and saying, well, maybe I should only eat with formerly Jewish converts. And so this gives us just a feel for the kind of challenges we're, we're, uh, we're dealing with. The people who came now after Paul and Barnabas' trip to those countries, the people who came up from Jerusalem had not been authorized by anybody to do what they did. They began to stir up trouble in Antioch, insisting that those who wanted to become Christians must first be circumcised and become full proselytes of Judaism. This, of course, led to a fierce disagreement between those visitors and members of the church at Antioch, such as Paul and Barnabas. I mean, if you just spent two years traveling through the countryside and converting and baptizing Gentiles, and you come back and say, nope, none of those people count, they got to go back and tell them to be circumcised and doing all that kind of stuff? No. So, what did they say? Well, they say, we better go back, to, we better take this matter to headquarters. We, we've got to do this officially. So off they went to Jerusalem. And who went to Jerusalem? Paul and Barnabas. And Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas. Okay. And others. Said. And others. We don't know for sure who those others were. Um, some people have suggested that maybe um, Titus might have been there. Uh, some people have suggested maybe Silas was one of those. We just don't know. Fourteen years later, yeah. Titus was with them. Oh, that's right. That was a later trip. Well, that, the 14 years later, that's the trip we're talking about now. It was 14 years after Paul was baptized, oh. mm. after Paul became... He went back to Jerusalem twice, Yeah, if I remember right. So yeah. this is roughly A.D. 49. Yeah, A.D. 49. This, was, this is the, where the time where it says after 14 years. Yeah, he did go back the second time, didn't he? That's when he was arrested. The second time he went back is the time he was arrested and put in prison. And right. Titus was with him then, <coughs> I believe. No, he no, he no. asked, he sent for Titus, didn't he? That was from that was from prison. Yeah, oh. yeah. Timothy. Timothy. And anyway, sent for, sent for. <laughs> traveling. Let's be honest. Traveling from Jerusalem to Antioch and spending a significant amount of time there would have been quite expensive. Who do you think paid for that trip? And why did they do it? And these, remember, are not Jews. These are supposedly Christians who came from Jerusalem, formerly Jews, that wanted to make sure that things were done right here, you see. You know, when, you're, when it's a matter of conscience, you, it, the cost doesn't matter. The cost doesn't matter, huh? You know, you got to do what you have to do. I see. Plus he was that was a, their attitude. He was a tent maker. I think he was self-supporting in many ways. Paul was. Right. But what but about these people who came from Jerusalem and tried to oppose what Paul was doing? Oh, who, they, they, were, they the were on fire. <laughs> See, <laughs> so the the they did whatever. <laughs> well, and if you read Galatians, chapter 1, verses 7 to 9, chapters 2, 4 to 5, chapter 5, verse 10, you find out that, in fact, these people 
seem to make a life duty of following Paul around and trying to convince people wherever he went that you can't be Christians unless you become a Jew first. Well, these, these opponents of Paul had a rather simple message. In order to be saved, converts from among the Gentiles must be circumcised and must keep all the other Jewish ceremonial laws. And we need to be honest. If you read places like Genesis 17, 9 to 14, and Exodus 12, 43 to 49, where it talks about people who wanted to become a part of the Jewish nation and what they had to do, see, they had these verses supporting their cause. Well, they felt like in order to be a Christian, you must first be a part of the covenant group of people. And the covenant people in their minds were the Jews. Well, of course, on the other hand, we know that there are many passages in the Old Testament talking about how the Jews were supposed to spread the gospel, the good news about God to others. The first such passage goes way back to the days of first, the first, almost first contact with Abraham. Genesis 12, verse 3, I will bless you, I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you, and through you I will bless all the nations. Is there any distinction there about saying you've got to be circumcised first? Abraham wasn't even circumcised when he got that message. Yeah. Such a stir was caused in Antioch that the cooler heads thought they should make this mat, take this matter back to Jerusalem, make a collective decision. So Paul and Barnabas and probably some others, we already just talked about that just briefly, um, do you think maybe people from other cities came for this gen first general conference? Probably. Maybe especially the ones nearby, like uh, Samaria, for example. Well, well, the, I don't know how. First obstacle might be just coming to Jerusalem amongst the Jews because they would have been. But they must have if there was a good Samaritan going down from Jerusalem to Jericho in Jesus' story. So maybe they were more mobile than. Do we? we think of them. Okay. Do we have any hints from Jesus himself that circumcision was um, not going to be compulsory? Washing hands. Okay. He talked a lot about some other ceremonial stuff. Yeah. Matthew 15, 2 and 9, just two verses here, gives us a little bit of a hint. Why is it your, this, they, they came to Jesus, why is it your disciples disobey the teaching handed down by our ancestors? They don't wash their hands in the proper way before they eat. They eat. And then there was a bit of a discussion. And Jesus said, it is no use for them to worship me because they teach human rules as though they were my laws. But now, wasn't circumcision given by God? Yes. So that's not a human rule, that's God's rule. So how are we going to deal with that? Do we, do we today think that men should be circumcised if they want to be Christians? No. no. Well, what they said was, let's be a little bit fair to their side. Jesus was a Jewish Messiah. He was, a, he was sent to the Jewish people. There's, you know, we know that he traveled to Tyre and Sidon. Yes. We know that he traveled to... Uh, to Caesarea Philippi. We know that he traveled over on the other side of the Jordan River, but basically his ministry, his, his efforts were to the Jewish people. So they, they thought, you know, this is our Jewish Messiah. If you want to be saved you, by this Messiah, you've got to be one of us. Well, what did Paul, how did Paul respond to that? Well, he had some pretty strong, strong things to say. I, we won't take time to read these verses, but Romans 3, 30 and 31, 1 Corinthians 7, 18, Galatians 3, 28 and 29. Let me read that one. Just So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham. So he, he's not even going to say, well, you know, you, you can be saved even though you're not a descendant of Abraham. You are descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. So, now this was written after this conference though. Yes, it was. But, I mean, this represents Paul's attitude, I think, his, his understanding. Well, 
it, it, it should be clear that these Judaizers are mixing up these two, con these two concepts. If you're going to be a part of the congregation, a part of the, our distinct group, then, I mean, the, and you have to be in order to be a Christian, in order to be saved, salvation. So there's this, do we belong to the community or don't we belong to the community? Well, what do we know from the Old Testament? We know that there were a lot of people who were Jews who are not going to be saved, and there were other, some people, in the Old Testament who were not Jews who will be saved. And there's a great discussion of that if you want to read it in Romans 4, verses 9 to 13. And by the way, Abraham himself, at what point did he get his circumcision? He was an old man, wasn't he? He was an old man, <clears throat> exactly. After Ishmael there. was born. After Ishmael was born, exactly. And not only that, he already had God's Seal that he was he had faith and he was he was saved well all of that thus to view circumcision as a kind of entrance requirement to god's covenant as meritorious and leading salvation that's what they wanted and dennis i think you've got something about yes, that yes this is from the adult sabbath school bible study guide for monday august 20. so to impose circumcision on believing gentiles as a means of salvation was to distort the gospel truth uh, in Galatians 1, 7, 2, verses 3 to 5. Nullify God's grace, Galatians 2, 21, and make Jesus of no benefit, Galatians 5, 2. <laughs> Furthermore, it was a denial of the universal character of salvation, Colossians 3, 11, Titus 2, 11. Paul could never agree to this type of thinking. He was pretty strong by the time he finished his business, having contended with Judaizers for years and years, boy, he was, <coughs> we're not going to accept that at all. Well, do I dare I to ask about us? Are we, um, are we born on the Adventist bus and we just have to make sure we don't get off so we'll automatically arrive at the kingdom? Well, it's probably our nature to try to develop or think of externals that might signs mm -hmm. that might give us confidence that we're we're part of the group or to require somebody else so these external things uh, even though this external thing was uh, you know initiated by God uh, I think we we can make things up that uh, that are uh, us versus them right Mm -hmm. <laughs> commandments of men rather than the commandments okay. of God. Yeah. Well, let's just read a little bit about what happened there. Acts 15. Question. Yes. So is there something equivalent to circumcision today that's dividing Christians and Seventh-day Adventists? Do you want to? Yeah, I'm curious what you think. <laughs> well, the, the things that we would point to as Adventists would be the Seventh-day Sabbath, our distinct health messages. Uh, well, do Seventh Day Adventists disagree about the Seventh Day Sabbath? You're not supposed to ask questions like that. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's in do. our name. Yes. What divides us, I think, right now, is the polarization between the people that think it's just fine for women to be ordained. So women's ordination could be a little bit like that. Yeah, and we've. We've gone through phases. Those who've been Adventists for years and years, like I have, yeah. can remember other things that seem to be, we're going to tear the church apart. Boy, it was us and them. Mm -hmm. We're right. You guys are right. Okay, so let's go back to Jerusalem. After a long debate, so considering the fact that people had come a long distance and got at considerable expense, I'm sure they spent several days discussing these issues. And everybody had an opportunity to clearly say what they wanted to say, with scripture, scripture support, I'm sure. These people, remember, Paul had memorized, almost certainly memorized the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. And he was on one side, and here are these other guys quoting, we already have references to things they quoted. So that, it, this was a scripture against scripture, knock down, drag out kind of a fight. Well, after a long debate, Peter stood up and said, My brothers and sisters, you know that a long time ago God chose me from among you to preach the good news. This is Acts 15, verses 7 to 11 I'm reading. Mm 
so that they could hear and believe. And God, who knows the thoughts of everyone, showed his approval of the Gentiles by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he had to us. He made no difference between us and them. He forgave their sins because they believed. And of course, he's talking about Cornelius, isn't he? Mm -hmm. So then why do you, you now want to put God to the test by laying a load on the backs of the believers, which neither our ancestors nor we ourselves are able to carry? That's a pretty compelling argument, isn't it? But Sounds like he, but specifically, what was he referring to there? He was talking about all the pharisaical requirements. All the uh, stuff that we call the laws of Moses that yeah. God gave, the ceremonial law we would say today. Yeah, the ceremonial law. And particularly, I'm sure, there was the issue of circ circumcision. Mm -hmm. So many details, I guess. Yeah. I think Paul had the outlook of a lawyer. Mm -hmm. He thought that way. Yeah. Well, Paul gives an emphatic no to Luke, who's doing the writing here. We believe and are saved by the grace, I mean, I'm sorry, it's Peter. We believe and are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they are. Well, here, Peter sounds as if he were totally won over by Paul. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or was yeah. Peter Paul. totally won over by himself? Yeah, he had <laughs> experience with Cornelius and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, fell on the Gentiles who were not circumcised. Yes. He asserted that all the requirements of the ceremonies had already been a burden that even the Jews themselves were not able to bear. Don't you imagine that both sides in this argument presented powerful evidence, supported by what they believed were unanswerable reasons why their thinking was correct? What do we do when there's a situation like that? No doubt, many passages of Scripture were quoted. The fact that only the comments from Peter and James, the stepbrother of Jesus, are recorded very briefly suggests that they were considered to be leaders among the people. Okay? So, what happens next? Well, let's look at... Uh, well, let's, let's... Yeah, I guess we should read Acts 15, 13. When they had finished speaking, James spoke up, Listen to me, my brothers and sisters. Simon has just explained how God first showed his care for the Gentiles by taking from among them a people to belong to him. The words of the prophets agree completely with this, as the scripture says, and here's some more scripture, After this I will return, says the Lord, and restore the kingdom of David. I will rebuild its ruins and make it strong again. And so all the rest of the human race will come to me and all the Gentiles whom I have called to be my own, so says the Lord who made this known long ago. How many does that leave out? Nobody. It is my opinion, James went on, that we should not trouble the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write a letter telling them not to eat any food that is ritually unclean because it has been offered to idols, to keep themselves from sexual immorality, not to eat <coughs> an animal that has been strangled, or any blood. For the law of Moses has been read for a very long time in the synagogues every Sabbath, and his words are preached in every town. So, so what's James? So is that how people are saved? Well, that was the question we want to look at next, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. what's, what's, what's James trying to say here? I'm sure he's, he's trying to straddle the fence. And what's he saying? You do not need to be circumcised or follow all these Jewish things to become a Christian. One. On the other side, if you want to go to a, a gathering and you want to sit down with formerly Jewish Christians and you don't want to offend them, you will practice these things. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Or a fair summary? Mm -hmm. Well, so it has nothing to do with salvation. No. Paul already said so in yeah. the, quote, the quotes we read from, from the Dennis read to us. But to an outsider, it might come across. Uh, this is all is needed. Nothing else is needed. No, I, I think uh, uh, he's saying, look, there are things that we are fundamental that we believe in. Mm -hmm. Okay, but beyond that, uh, should not, don't do things. I mean, some of things are very simple. The seventh commandment, you know, I mean, it's understood, but he mentions it there. Uh, Paul later had problems with, he says, no, nah, it doesn't matter. It's uh, offered to the idol, who cares? Mm 
At the same time, uh, Daniel would say, no, I'm not going to touch that stuff. So, so why didn't Paul say something about the food offered to idols at the Jerusalem conference? Because uh, what was it? Corinth or someplace, all the food that was being sold in the marketplace. Okay, let's save that idols. discussion for the next class because we, we don't want to steal all our thunder from that time. Carrie, I think you've got the conclusion there in Acts 15, 28, and 29. Yes. The Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to put any other burden on you beside these necessary rules. Eat no food that has been offered to idols, eat no blood, eat no animal that has been strangled, and keep yourselves from sexual immorality. You will do well if you take care not to do these things with our best wishes. That's from the Good News Bible translation. Okay, so. <clears throat> We've already discussed, does this have anything to do with salvation? Nothing. Probably just to keep from offending others. Yeah. So, do we have a responsibility not to offend other Christians? I think to a certain level, yes. Mm -hmm. We who are strong ought to bear with those who are weak and not just please ourselves. And you remember there's a place in the Bible where there's a whole chapter on that. It's called Romans, Romans 14. Chapter 14. <laughs> yeah. I think we at times have forgotten there are going to be other people in heaven besides us. <laughs> oh, there's going to be a special little category, a little <laughs> high wall. <laughs> no, it's 144 and the countless people following. Yeah, there so. you go. <laughs> Thank you. So, what do we know about later history involving sexual immorality or food offered to idols? Did this solve the problem? Look at Revelation 2, verse 14. Now this is talking about the church at Pergamum. I believe, hold on just a second, let me get my computer to come on here. Yeah, this is the message to Pergamum, okay? But there are a few things I have against you. There are some among you who would follow the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak how to lead the people of Israel into sin by persuading them to eat food that had been offered to idols and to practice sexual immorality. Does that sound like Acts 15? Mm -hmm. Same words, exactly. And we believe that this church we call Pergamum represents the Christian church hundreds of years later. So is this still an issue? Well, apparently it was an issue for quite a while. It must have been a pretty big issue at the time to carry on for that many years. They felt that it was that. On the other side of that coin, there are many Christians today who treat the dietary prohibitions mentioned in this letter as temporary restrictions that were to be observed because of their offensive nature to Jewish believers. And that certainly is true. They are happy to throw out all the rest of the Old Testament laws, including the Levitical food laws and the Sabbath commandment, even though they were not mentioned in this list. Many modern Christians feel those commands are no longer binding. Is Acts 15 a good basis for rejecting the Sabbath, for example? I have a comment yeah. about, you know, all that divorce in the church, okay, don't you think sexual immorality is at the bottom of it? No, Jackie, <laughs> how could you suggest that? I mean, <laughs> I know, but it's, it's a reality still today. It's a you huge mean we issue, all, we I think. we don't all get along just perfectly through our entire lives? Mm. Yeah, isn't that too bad? <laughs> You're talking about marriages and the problem yeah. with being unfaithful. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think yeah. That's a big problem, huge yeah. problem. Our and then, and then, Mr. A goes with Mrs. B to a different church, and they start up in their heads of pathfinders and all that. I mean, 
Yeah. It's a huge thing. <clears throat> uh, nothing new under the sun. So no, it's nothing it's new. It's the same human condition. Yes. Mm -hmm. 2,000 yes. years later, we yes. still struggle yes. with these things. And yet people going through that think that they're so such an individual and they can't possibly, no, that isn't me, I, you know. And there's a lot of other is that sexual issues in our church. Well, not so much in our church, but I mean in, in the world today, let's, let's say, I mean, we're dealing with homosexuality and so forth. I'm studying right now with a young lady that I work with, and she's listening to some materials, and I'm discussing them with her, and she has some close friends who are lesbian. And she just went through the lesson on how we believe that God originally intended for a male to marry a female and the family to be a... And she says, and she's leaning in favor of what the Bible says, but she's not quite sure what she can say to her friends. And that's a tough question. You know, you want to offend them? And uh, it's become even more of an issue now that marriage is legal. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, you could say, well, well, this is the way it is, but what do you do now? Yeah. And I want to, I want to just pose a, a general question in that area. I want you out there to think very carefully about this question. We started the United States as a Christian nation. We, our, our founding fathers came to this country uh, it, to escape oppression by other Christian groups. And this was supposed to be a place where Christianity could be practiced freely and so forth. And as a result, over the years, we have said people have come from various other backgrounds. And we say, fine, welcome. You know, it's a, this is a free country. Come here. And, well, what we're seeing now is these people who have come, and I'm not blaming any particular group, but they seem to think that because there may be a few of them, I mean, including other groups, even atheists feel like that they have just as much right in this country as Christians. <coughs> And that they have, should, they have the ability to throw out the Ten Commandments from our courthouses, to take down the crosses because that's... So what we're, what we're facing now is a time that if you really believe what the Bible says and you want to live according to it, and you want to tell <coughs> about the gospel, you are by definition a bigot because you believe that your fundamentals are more important than somebody else's fundamentals. And this is going to be a huge problem. It already is, but it's going to be a huge problem for, for Christians and Seventh-day Adventists because eventually it'll be us who believe in the Sabbath and some other things that are specific to our church against a lot of other people who say, you know, why can't we just love each other and get along? Why do you have to be so stuck on your own things? And that's going to be a problem, folks. Isn't that Satan's original complaint up in heaven? Exactly. Exactly. Well, by reading Leviticus 17 and 18, which we don't have time to do right now, but we would encourage you to look at it if you want to look at, carefully look at this, it's pretty clear that these original things about food offered to idols and, 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 and blood and all that kind of stuff were specifically addressed or uh, uh, as as prevention of pagan practices so this was a this was a way of god saying keep away from pagan sp religious practices particularly tear down those pagan idols have nothing to do with those pagan practices because you're a separate and distinct people well what about do we follow any principles that would sort of set us aside from others that came along even before the days of Moses? Can you think of any? Oh, Sabbath well, certainly I mean, came. Sabbath. Exactly, an obvious one is the keeping of the Sabbath. Sure. Mm -hmm. So we can't blame that as the, mo the laws of Moses so-called as, as being responsible for the keeping of you know, this issue. Um, and the Old Testament says clearly as health, as health rules we're not supposed to eat any blood or any fat. People sometimes forget that. What? Orthodox kosher laws. Yeah, orthodox kosher rules. By the way, uh, I have some friends 
a young, not so young lady in, anymore in my generation, who grew up in Spain. And her family was very, fairly wealthy, and they loved to go down and buy the meat from the bulls that had just come from the bullfight. Mm -hmm. And why do you suppose they liked it? Loaded with adrenaline. It was full of waste products. It's waste products and fat that give meat its flavor. And God probably specifically said we should not eat those things so we wouldn't develop such a, an appetite for what are relatively unhealthful things. Well, what should we be learning from the Acts 15 experience? The leaders there in Jerusalem did something, which I think was important. They said, we're going to send a letter to the people in Antioch, particularly, and probably copies to other church groups around. By the way, if we could if we could get one of those letters, it would probably be the very first Christian document, written document. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a multi-billionaire real quick, just find one of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they not only wrote that letter, who did they send? They sent a couple of... Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas went back, but of course they were on one side of this argument, so maybe they would distort what we said. So we have to send some other people along who will be give a fair presentation, right? They sent Silas. Silas and a man by the name of Judas Barsabbas. They traveled to Antioch and said, yes, this is the vowed letter, this is the conclusions we came to at the meeting. So. Uh, Look at Acts 15, 30 to 33. The messengers were sent off and went to Antioch where they gathered the whole group of believers and gave them the letter. When the people read it, they were filled with joy by the message of encouragement. Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, spoke a long time with them, giving them courage and strength. After spending some time there, they were sent off in peace by the believers and went back to those who had sent them. Prophets? I thought prophets were just in the Old Testament. No, Paul said, would that you all would be prophets. Uh, seek the higher gifts, and uh, including prophecy in 1 okay. Corinthians. Okay. Do we have any other named prophets in the New Testament? Even a female, Elizabeth, I think, was a prophetess. Okay. Did well, you any other? Uh, uh, was it Philip's daughters? We're prophetesses. That's yeah. four of them, all four of them. Yeah. Any others? We, w there's some other times when it mentions prophets. Um, the, the, the group of people who sets Paul and Barnabas aside and said, go out on your first yeah. missionary journey, among those, it says, were some prophets. We all, don't know the name. All the disciples were prophets. Well, ultimately, yes. Unfortunately, we know that the decisions from this Jerusalem Council did not resolve the issues permanently. And, Margaret, I think you've got a okay. few words on that. Jerusalem was the metropolis of the Jews, and it was here that the greatest exclusiveness and bigotry were found. The Jewish Christians living within sight of the temple naturally allowed their minds to revert to the peculiar privileges of the Jews as a nation. When they saw the Christian church departing from the ceremonies and traditions of Judaism and perceived that the peculiar sacredness which the Jewish customs had been invested would soon be lost sight of in the light of the new faith, many grew indignant with Paul as the one who had, in a large measure, caused this change. Even the disciples were not at all prepared to accept willingly the decision of the council. Some were zealous for the ceremonial law, and they regarded Paul with disfavor because they thought that his principles in regard to the obligations of the Jewish law were lax. This came from Ellen G. White, Acts of the Apostles, page 197-1. Okay. So, I want you to, I, 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 I really want us to, to try to get a feel of what this is like. Among all the former adherents to the strict Jewish codes and promoters of those strict Jewish codes was Paul. Mm 
And now what's happened? He's a complete <laughs> turnaround. A complete turnaround. And I mean, I'm sure. I mean, I, I, I try to think of what it would be like to, meet, what, to have been there in that Jerusalem Council. Hmm. We don't know what the educational levels were of many of the people who were there. The disciples, sure. former disciples were, we believe, per, pretty much uneducated fishermen. And here among them is what, effect, in effect, was a university professor. Mm -hmm. And yet they felt quite free to stand up and said, but well, we had the best education of all, three and a half years with Jesus <laughs> himself. Okay. Well, Jim, you want to add your words there? It's from the Acts of the Apostles, Ellen White. 189 says, the Jewish converts generally were not inclined to move as rapidly as the providence of God opened the way. From the result of the apostles' labor among the Gentiles, it was evident that the converts among the latter people would far exceed the Jewish converts in number. The Jews feared that if the restrictions and ceremonies of their laws were not made obligatory, on the Gentiles as a condition of church fellowship, the national peculiarities of the Jews, which had hitherto kept them distinct from all other people, would finally disappear from among those who received the gospel message. Oh dear. <coughs> so what's the problem here? A little jealousy. A little jealousy. And I might add, this ended up being a huge, almost knockdown, down drag-out fight over the next couple hundred years between the Jewish, Jew, the Jewish Jews and the Jewish Christians. Because in, the, in most of the civilized world of that time, the Bible that they used was the Greek translation called the Septuagint. That is, of course, the Old Testament. The Jews felt that this was their book. It was their national history. The Jewish Christians said, no, this Old Testament is half of a combined book, and the other half is the New Testament, and these two make a complete book. So we need to point out all the way through as we read these how the Old Testament predicts the New Testament, and the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And the Jewish Jews said, nothing doing. Keep your New Testament out of here, away from it. And um, of course, what happened ultimately is that the number of Christians greatly exceeded the number of Jews, and so the Christians went out and they commandeered the Old Testament, the, the Septuagint, and later on the, the Latin Vulgate as well, that became a Christian version of the Old Testament. The Jews in response said, okay, take your translations, we'll go back to the original language and we will preserve, and thus we have the Masoretes who carefully, carefully, carefully preserved the Jewish, uh, uh, the, the Hebrew, scriptures of the Old Testament down through the years. And there was this battle all the way along. Okay, do we, do we go back to the Hebrew? Do we check it? Do we, do we accept it's a Jewish book? Or do we go in with the, the more modern translations? The, yes, Jim. The Hebrew was probably a dead language by the time they left Babylon. Almost. And so here they're trying to re reconstruct it, something that makes it. And then, of course, the uh, what we end up in most of our Bibles is the Masoretic text, which is about a thousand years after the uh, Septuagint version, which is about 200 B.C. So, But of course we have now much of the Old Testament reconstructed from the Dead Sea, Dead sea Scrolls. Scrolls yes. It shows that this was, in fact, pretty much the Old Testament that Jesus had in his day. And if those of you who are really interested in that question, it's possible to actually get a Dead Sea Scrolls Bible uh, that gives you what, from whatever from the Old Testament that's available from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's very interesting to read. And it if is. you're interested in the whole history of the Bible, yes. Ken has a series on theox.org about uh, called How the Bible Came to Us. It's a yeah. series of about 20 lessons and handouts and recordings. But I've got an English translation of the Septuagint, and that's quite interesting. And there's a fair difference in certain yes. verses, which kind of surprised me at first. The, and interestingly enough, uh, 
the places the biggest differences are in the book of Daniel, mm. which is a little bit worrisome to us. There are actually three different versions of the book of Daniel. Are those important ones? Like, <coughs> I'm sorry, yeah. um, chapter 9, verses 24 down? They are, there are whole sections that are missing in some of those translations. Yeah. Mm. And why somebody decided to do that and how, where that came from. But we, that's not our discussion for right now. It would be very instructive if one had time to do so, to choose a group of people to represent each of these two sides and have a replay of Acts 15. Do you think we would come to the same conclusions today that they did? Perhaps. I'd love to see young people do that. It should be clear that even belonging to a group that regards itself as God's faithful people is not always easy. Do we easily accept those we formerly might have avoided? As Adventists, do we have a superiority complex, thinking of ourselves as a privileged people? No, we are privileged. Why are we privileged? There is no group in the history of the world that has access to more truth, including not only all the Bible, but all the writings of Ellen White, as we do. We are just in a, in a category by ourselves. Well, in our church, we have conservative groups and liberal groups. Why do conservatives look down on liberals? That's what liberals think. <laughs> that's the way they are. <laughs> I read a, that's the way we are. <laughs> I read an article a number of years ago, and I've lost it, but it was uh, by a political science professor. Mm -hmm. And the diff it was on the difference between conservatives and liberals. So he's, mm -hmm. he's not looking at it from religious particularly, but he mm -hmm. said that his conclusion was that conservatives uh, look for truth outside of themselves and then ask of a situation, is this right? Liberals look within themselves for truth and then ask, does this work? And I think this was meant to be, uh, you know, like a, a feedback cycle. In mm -hmm. other words, if you just, if you don't take anything from the outside, then you're just going to be reinventing the wheel. Yeah. And on the other hand, if you misunderstand what the external truth really is, you will always be trying to do the same thing and getting the wrong results. So, um, okay. So why do we have conflicts in places like Congress? <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Liberals oh. look down on conservatives. Oh. Will there ever be a way to reconcile such groups? Mm. And here's Elijah a big here, here's a bigger question that we need to think about: Why do we personally choose to be a member of? one group or the other? Is it our parents? Is it our education? Is it our associates? Or uh, could it also be our understanding of thus said the Lord? Well, yes, that's, that would certainly be what he calls a conservative group. Looking yeah. outside for truth. Well, and, and yeah, let me put, I would put that in a slightly different way, but you, you, you said it well. Do we have an external standard by which we, I mean, that's what's, I mean, even in our nation, we're supposed to be going by, you know, Constitution. the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And what do we see? We see that every day they're chipping away at it. Every day they're chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. Every succeeding generation that I've ever seen in my work, everyone as it advances has less respect for any kind of law and order. Yeah. Just continual. Yeah. Theological well, what you, entropy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> A quick question. Yeah. Is it perhaps healthy for the remnant church to have such <laughs> Jerusalem councils every now and then? and? Uh, uh, those of us could think about uh, Glacier View, for example. Mm -hmm. um, Ellen White has said somewhere that there's never going to be a major split within the church, even though some of us feel that it might happen any time. 
But if that is going to be true, I, to me, I think as long as it takes us on our knees, uh, I think it's very healthy for us yeah. to struggle with issues because yes. it should bring us closer and closer to the Lord. If we can disagree without being disagreeable, mm -hmm. that's a very useful thing and we ought to do it all the time. In the, in the discussions about the ordination of women, we've had these councils and where, have, where has it gotten us? Well, I hope that some of the people who've come to listen in on those councils have gotten a clearer picture at least. Um, I don't know. <laughs> what, what, what I can... We well, don't have a letter saying yes. the Holy Spirit and we say this, or, or maybe we do By have the way, that. By how did, how, did, how did they come to such a firm stand? Did yeah. someone have a vision overnight saying, yes, boom, I agree. Yeah, I listened to that and kind of went, okay, the Holy Spirit in us, I thought, well, how did they know? I mean, it wasn't a Pentecostal experience where, zoom, this is... Well, I mean, and I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. I think it's a question we need to think about. Remember that there were several people in that group that did have visions from God. So it's possible that someone did receive a vision. I mean, I'm not saying that that's the answer, but that's possible. I like what James said in his argument and coming to the conclusion. He quotes from Amos. Yeah. He says, the Lord told us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, was there any gloating, do you think, after the council was over? No. I hope not. Did the former Pharisees feel completely defeated? If so, they went forth with greater fervor to do their, continue doing their work. Did they have anything to do with the later decision of the leaders in Jerusalem, the Christian leaders in Jerusalem that led to the rest of Paul and his imprisonment? Mm -hmm. Sally, I think you've got something to say about that. Something remarkable took place at the Jerusalem Council. Ingrained theological, biblical, and sociological principles and practices that had been reinforced for millennia were now about to officially shift from adult teachers no, at Sabbath school. Yeah, I noticed that officially yeah. shift. Change is always painful to some. Is there, history, is there evidence from the history of the Jews and even times prior to that, that occasionally things do change? That God might actually change? I mean, we have verses that seem to suggest that God doesn't change. Well, let's think about some. Outside the Garden of Eden, God said to Adam and Eve, build an altar, sacrifice a lamb. Well, after the children of Israel got into the land of Canaan, God says, nope, no personal altars anymore. You only sacrifice your lambs at the temple in Jerusalem. Isn't that a change? Mm -hmm. Well, they were told to meet God strictly. In, uh, uh, later, I'm sorry, later the temple was destroyed and the children of Israel were told to move from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. There, there isn't any temple anymore to, uh, where you can offer lambs. Then a whole new revelation came to the children of Israel in the form of Jesus Christ himself, living that perfect life and dying that awful death on Calvary. This revelation through Jesus was that of God himself, better than all previous revelations. So do we take that as our ultimate standard? I hope so. Well, what principles can we, can we review very quickly in the last couple of minutes we've got that we should learn from this story? God had performed miracles to actually support the changes which were being recommended. We know about the story of Cornelius particularly and the story of Philip. The changes were discussed and agreed upon by the church in joint discussions. Both sides came together, they discussed it together. All, three, all sides were given free opportunity to express their ideas and leadership. Lis leadership listened carefully to the arguments. That's an interesting situation. The exponential growth among Gentiles indicated that God was at work among them. I mean, if God didn't intend for the Jews to, I mean, sorry, the Gentiles to become a part of the Christian church, why were so many of them being converted? 
Pharisees were on both sides of this argument. Remember that Paul was a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. We should support the Old Testament from the old, there was support from the Old Testament quoted for, for the new approach. So there was biblical support for what they had decided. The members of the Jerusalem Council believed that the careful way in which things had been handled gave them permission to claim the support of the Holy Spirit for what they had done. Does it seem clear to you that from what we read in Acts 15 that circumcision was no, no longer to be required in order to be a part of God's covenant people? How do you feel about a God who apparently changed his mind and his requirements? Isn't it clear from the Old Testament that circumcision was required? Charles, I think no. you're going to okay. want to read us something there. <laughs> Comment first, if you like. Let's read. One can almost hear the list of scriptures the believing Pharisees must have marshaled as they debated the Gentile circumcision issue acts 15 5 and 7 the texts on the circumcision are clear imperative and often specifically include the foreigner genesis 17 12 to 14 and 27 exodus 12 44 48 joshua 5 44 to 9 there are no texts to the contrary but there are a number of texts that point out that Jews were supposed to spread the gospel to the Gentiles, even in the Old Testament times. Textually, their argument would appear all right. All right. Airtight. Also, airtight. Sorry, airtight. Also, common sense could argue that Jesus was a Jewish Messiah coming to the Jewish nation, as foretold in the prophetic scriptures of the Jewish religion. It is so far-fetched to say that one must become a Jew in order to benefit from a Jewish savior. The right of circumcision would accomplish just that. Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide 108. Okay, well, Acts 15 must be understood in the context of the entire history of the Jewish people in the Old Testament. We must try to put ourselves into the situations we read about in Scripture and try to determine what we would have done if we had been there. Even more challenging is to think about what would we have done if we had been God in that situation. So we throw the question to you, what would you have done at the Jerusalem Council? Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for this privilege we've had to discuss your word think about the issues here and to understand that not everything is always black and white. There are both sides to almost every question. May we understand them. May we make the right choices in our lives as Christians is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.